Hi, this is Stuart Weems and welcome to the Investopoly podcast. My goal is to give you simple, easy to understand strategies, insights and tips to help you master the game of building wealth. And in this episode, I'd like to talk about property versus shares, but really approach the debate uh, differently. See, it's my thesis that property is an okay investment, but not as good as shares. However, when you factor in the gearing, so the ability to borrow to invest in property, the the ability to invest in property without contributing any of your own cash, at least up front, uh, property becomes a, a wonderful investment, much better than shares. And so that was my thesis. And what I wanted to do is sort of pull apart the numbers to try and demonstrate that to, to listeners. But before we do that, let's talk about some pros and cons. So really, let's talk about the main advantages of uh, shares and or property. Uh, So let's talk about shares first. Uh, Of course, uh, with shares, it's a lot more hands off. You can outsource the management of a share portfolio to a financial advisor like myself. uh, Or if it's a relatively small amount that you've invested, you could just invest in, you know, some diversified index funds. Uh, and you don't need to do anything. In fact, iShares, uh, its ASX 200 index fund, iShares actually reduced the cost for that fund to 0.05 uh, of a percent or five basis points, whatever it is, it's super, super cheap. If you invest $100,000 in that fund, uh, you're paying $50 a year in investment management fees. Uh, as I said, it's really cheap and a really easy way to do it. Uh, whereas with property, uh, sometimes it can take time. You know, you might have to spend time managing the managing agent or dealing with tenant issues or arranging property maintenance and repairs. Uh, so from a hands-off perspective, shares can be uh, or is often uh, a less time-consuming uh, asset class to invest in. The other advantage of shares is it has a more stable level of income. It depends on how you invest and Um, how your portfolio is structured, uh, but it can do. So for example, the ASX 200, top 200 uh, stock index in Australia, has yielded circa 4.5% pretty consistently over a long period of time. So again, if I put some money in there and, you know, I want a stable level of income, you know, shares are going to do that. Whereas again, with property, you know, you could have unforeseen expenses that, that come out of nowhere that impact um, your income. Uh, and also, uh, finally, the major advantage with shares is liquidity. So low entry and exit costs, uh, which is good, no stamp duty, real, real estate agent fees, buying and selling costs, etc., are negligible. But it also means that you can invest and divest in small increments, which gives you a lot of flexibility as you get older, or particularly if you want to um, potentially reduce your working hours before you get to uh, age 60, when it, which typically most people can access super, uh, you know, having a, a portfolio of shares gives you that flexibility. Okay, so let's talk about the advantages of property then. Uh, and firstly, and, and arguably most importantly, as I'm going to demonstrate today, is that most investors feel comfortable borrowing to invest in property. And that means that you can, or it forces you firstly to invest a large amount upfront in one transaction, which is good from a compounding capital growth perspective. And it means so long as you can comfortably afford to service the borrowings, it means that you don't need to contribute any cash up front. So the ability, uh, firstly, and then the comfortability with uh, borrowing to invest in property is, is its most substantial advantage in my view. Uh, secondly, the, the assets tangibility can make investors feel more comfortable. Uh, so again, this is really, I would say this is more of an emotional consideration and really we shouldn't let our emotions guide our investment decisions. I would much rather try and counsel someone to understand different options and why they might not be as risky as they first seem. Uh, but certainly it's true that um, some people feel a lot more comfortable with property because you can walk through it, you can see it, it's very tangible, it's a very tangible asset. Uh, you don't need ongoing financial advice if you're a property investor. Typically, you know, you might obviously get advice from a buyer's agent when you first purchase the asset, but from an ongoing uh, f- advice fee perspective, you don't need uh, advice in regards to property. However, of course, if you have a million dollars invest in the share market, you know, I would argue most people should have that uh, portfolio professionally managed by a financial advisor. 
Uh, and lastly, uh, investment-grade property delivers most of its return in capital growth rather than income, whereas with particularly with Australian shares, it's about 50-50 even amount of income and capital gains. Well, it's just going to depend on uh, your age and stage of life and your other assets, which is more appropriate, but certainly from a taxation perspective, having more capital growth uh, and you can compound that growth without paying tax until you sell the the asset, uh, from a taxation perspective, that is far more powerful uh, as a way to uh, actually build net wealth. And, and so if that's your goal, you know, property uh, certainly ticks that box. Now we can debate which is better, property or shares, but I really think it's a meaningless debate. I think the answer is that they're both really good asset classes uh, and, you know, that most investors would be well served by investing in both of them, maybe at different times or stages of life. But uh, by the time we get to retirement, however, hopefully we've got a broad spread of different asset classes. And to argue one is better than the other, I, I, mean, I think it's a little, use the analogy, a golfing analogy, it's a little bit like saying, you know, which is the best golf club? Um, the answer is that you need a, a variety of golf clubs for different shots in order to play golf well. So as I said at the beginning, I think it's really the gearing that is associated with property that drives most of its returns, not the property asset itself, which is not to say property is a terrible investment, but really just to recognise that it's the gearing that works or that drives property returns, not property in itself. And so instead of it being a shares versus a property decision, I think it's more correctly a gearing versus no gearing decision. So if you, if you think if you're in the financial position where borrowing to invest is safe, you're comfortable with it, um, it's appropriate for your circumstances, then it's really go and borrow and invest in property. However, if, if borrowing now, increasing your level of borrowings isn't appropriate, then it's really invest in shares. And so that's why I think it's a gearing versus no gearing decisions rather than a property versus shares debate. Now, for those of, that have listened to this podcast for a while, you know that I'm just not here to share my opinions, that it's all about the evidence. Uh, and I think uh, uh, adopting an evidence-based approach is, uh, really reduces your risk. Uh, and that most things can be explained simply uh, using basic logic or maths. Uh, and so this is what I wanted to do is use some basic maths uh, to, to model uh, different investment options to sort of pull apart the returns. So what I did is I financially modelled borrowing to invest in a property for a million dollars, holding that property for 25 years, and then selling the property to realise the cash sale proceeds after repaying the original loan that I used to buy it uh, or to fund it, uh, and, and also capital gains tax and any other selling costs. And I've got all the assumptions listed as you would expect in the, uh, in the show notes and in the blog on the website. Um, now, the benefit of doing this, that is borrowing to invest, is means you don't have to um, contribute any cash up front, but you do have to contribute cash towards the holding costs. So, of course, that the interest is going to be more than the net rental income after expenses, and you, the investor, have to meet, has to meet those costs, and really that's your cash contrib your cap capital contribution towards the investment asset. Okay, so what I did is I used the internal rate of return as a calculator for that kind of measures, you know, when you have to uh, make those cash contributions over the 25 years of holding that property and then you get a big reward in terms of, you know, the cash sale proceeds when you sell. The internal rate of return is 13.96% under that situation, 14% internal rate of return if you're investing in property. It's a really good return, right? There's no, there's no doubt about that. However, if you um, take the borrowings out of the equation, so let's say you instead of borrowing to borrowing a million dollars to go and buy a million dollar property, you put in a million dollars of your own money, the internal rate of return drops from let's say fourteen percent down to seven point four percent. So almost half the return if you take the gearing out. So gearing adds, you know, 45% of the total return. In fact, I've got a chart which sort of splits up how much of that total return is delivered by gearing, rental income and capital growth, how much is subtracted because of tax, mainly capital gains tax. Of course, you get some uh, negative gearing tax benefits, but the, the capital gains tax is the, the big negative uh, net, net from a net tax perspective. 
So anyway, if we compare that to a shares option, still ungeared. So if we, instead of taking our million dollars of cash and going and buying investment property and generating an internal rate of return of 7.4%, what happens if we put that million dollars into the share market, particularly the Australian share market? The internal rate of return is 10.3%. So almost 3% higher than an ungeared property investment. So that's why I say if you take the gearing out, Shares actually generate better returns, uh, net of all taxes, than what property does. Now, just as a side note, of course, most investors aren't going to feel comfortable dumping a million dollars into the share market tomorrow, because the reality is share markets are, have twice the volatility that property markets do, and I, I myself uh, wouldn't advise that typically either. Uh, so then I looked at, once if you invested that million dollars over the next 25 years, so on a monthly basis you know, invested $40,000 a year for the next 25 years. Um, the internal rate of return is just under 8%, still better than property, even though I'm investing those monies over 25 years. So no matter how you cut it, you know, shares, taking out gearing as an ungeared investment, shares are better than property. And as I said, it's got the advantages of having the liquidity, which means you can uh, invest and divest in increments, which is, as I said, really valuable. It's the gearing that drives all the returns with property and we wouldn't be comfortable gearing to the same level in the same way uh, as we do with property as we would with shares. Of course, that makes sense, right? So it's not a shares versus property debate. It's a really gearing versus no gearing decision. So what are some of the considerations you need to factor in when deciding whether to gear or to borrow or not borrow? Uh, well, let, let me list a few. Of course, it's not an exhaustive list. It's going to depend on your own individual circumstances. But here's some things. So firstly, of course, will the banks lend you any more money? Do you qualify for a loan? Uh, that's actually a big consideration today, given uh, the pressure on borrowing capacities. I'll, I'll write about that in a few weeks time. Uh, whether your borrowing capacity is in fact enough to to be able to buy a good quality asset. So whilst you might be able to borrow a certain amount, maybe it's just not worth uh, investing in property because it's not a, a substantial enough amount. In fact, that you'll have to uh, uh, make some compromises on the quality of the investment property that you might otherwise buy. Uh, of course, you need to think about your net asset base. Uh, you know, if you have a, a really low asset base, uh, then really gearing is more important, if you already have a well-established asset base, then arguably you don't really need to add the the gearing, the additional risk of gearing. How close you are to retirement uh, and all your desire to reduce working hours in the future. You know, adding more liabilities just increases your monthly commitments and perhaps gives you less flexibility rather than more flexibility in the future. The mixture, the mixture of existing assets that you have, investment assets that you have. You know, if you already have a whole bunch of property, well, maybe adding shares to complement the portfolio now is a better option. If you have no property, well, it might be a no-brainer to, to add some. Uh, and of course, your appetite for risk. You know, how, uh, how comfortable are you with borrowing to invest in that approach? Uh, in fact, I recorded a video about five years ago that sort of walks you through the, the typical life cycle of an investor so certainly check that out. I put the link in the show notes, of course, um, and it sort of takes you through. And, and gearing is one of those major considerations. You know, investors that first start out uh, are typically, you know, gearing suits their their situation a lot more than say someone that's approaching retirement, of course. So just to sum up, you know, I think both asset classes are, are, are fantastic. Uh, I invest in both, as you would imagine. Um, and they, they serve me very well and they serve other clients really well. So I'm not going to be drawn into a debate which is better. It's really just a question of which should I invest in now and what proportions. That's really what most people are kind of considering. I would argue that most people would be well served by investing in both. But it's quite possible that, you know, particularly people that are younger, start with property first because that adds the gearing, builds the your net worth, and then add shares later. With people that have already accumulated a bit of property, start thinking about adding shares and the benefits of doing that and the flexibility that it provides in the future. Okay, that's it for me for this week. Until next week, bye for now.